So please welcome Guy Rundle to the microphone. <clears throat> Is this on? Yes, can everybody hear me? Is this on or not? Okay, is that better? Yeah. All right, okay. Um, well, if the view through 30 news polls is a fine vista, then 2020 hindsight is pretty good too. I suspect there won't be many people here who suffered under the illusion that Malcolm Turnbull would turn out to be the centrist liberal secret boyfriend Medici Prince, <laughs> as most of the Herald's op-ed writers <laughs> appeared to imagine. But let's be honest, who didn't breathe a sigh of relief a few years ago when a corpse-faced Tony Abbott, when he's here brother, had to concede that Turnbull was now Prime Minister after a chaotic year starting with a blown budget and ending with Sir Prince Philip? Who didn't secretly welcome the end of the involuntary Kegel exercises, characteristic of the Abbott era, the buttocks clenching in embarrassment seven minutes into the six o'clock news once more? Who was not secretly relieved? And if a week is a long time in policy, politics, the short Turnbull era has been an eon. He was always going to be disappointing, even to the faintest hopes, but he has managed the next level in the way he has disappointed us, he has been disappointing. <laughs> Tony Abbott, well, that was an extraordinary spectacle. The man who had been constructed by some of us, this author included, as much as by the right, as the great nemesis, the conservative politician writer, the right-wing paladin with at least a set of ideas, someone who could put through a program, succeed or fail and change the terrain, turned out to be, as he physically looks, a composite, a man-made self, a selection of cuts of meat arranged Archimboldo-esque into a human being. <laughs> Santa Maria's last soldier was a screaming neurotic. The uh, young people at, who edit Crikey have a bell in the office and every time I put B.A. Santa Maria into an article, they ring the bell. They think it's hilarious. They think it's a game old people play, like, like croquet or something. Santa Maria's last soldier was a screaming neurotic. His buff form, what Wilhelm Reich called muscular armour against the world. Live flesh deadened by hardness. He made John Howard look like a tactical strategic combo of FDR, Otto von Bismarck and Mao Zedong. And after a while, it became clear that this was not only a man who could not get anything done, but had no desire to do so. Edmund Burke's great insight on conservatism in the Anglo-American form had been that it was about managing change. Abbott was in the style of Joseph de Maistre's executioner from the continental European tradition, whose response to change is the axe and only the axe. To negotiate, manage, strategize would have meant dealing with reality. Tony Abbott has spent his whole life in flight from such, and it's a measure of our era that he thought that politics would be a great place to continue the hideout. Malcolm, when he arrived, Malcolm was greeted with that relief, but also a certain type of concern on the left. He quickly killed off some lingering problems from an unsold, duplicitous, badly written budget, dispatched a couple of useless people, turned the public towards the future with the what a time to be alive malarkey. Hokey, but at least it was a direction of travel, at least it was something. Could he do the Menzies thing he had been invoking, reconcile the business liberals with the increasingly erratic reactionaries into a corporate market liberal conservatism? Should he succeed in that, one thought, then Labour would have no answer at all. Its leader was uninspiring, its capacity for sustained, sustained analysis and action almost gone, and much of its shadow front bench is, so free orient, is now so free market oriented as to be sympathetic to SCOMO's POMO, dark mofo modus operandi. <laughs> What the right values above all is success, and if Turnbull could suture it together, he could write his own ticket into the future. That hasn't happened, which is an uninteresting thing to say. But what is interesting is the near universal hatred that Malcolm Turnbull has generated, even from those who will grit their teeth and vote for him, and what that universal hatred 
that deep frustration tells us about our era and about our politics. The plain fact is that there is no alternative but to analyse Malcolm Turnbull, or more particularly, our reaction to him through the prism of psychoanalysis. Less about Turnbull's personal psychology, of which perhaps a little more in the Q&A, than the peculiar feelings that he and his government generates. The dominant character of the Turnbull government and Malcolm Turnbull is that it and he are awful. <laughs> there is something awful about it. Awfulness is the core essence of the Turnbull government. Yes, it's hateful in its treatment of Centrelink users, refugees, etc., etc. Yes, it is an uncomplicated right-wing neoliberal government giving away ever larger areas of the state and public life to corporations. Yes, it is happy to give away our sovereignty to both the Chinese and the US at the same time, which seems to take some sort of skill. But beyond all that, which is the character of many right-wing governments, beyond all that, something to itself is its awfulness. You need to reach for the English poet Philip Larkin to describe living under the Turnbull government. <laughs> Philip Larkin said of something, it is like being in a hospital waiting room on a Sunday afternoon in wet shoes. <laughs> it is Turnbull's seeming determination to be nothing at all that does it. Neither a party uniter, nor a liberal crusader, a bold free marketeer, or a converted conservative. It is his unerring determination to always hit the wrong note. It's the total lack of any direction on energy and climate change, even a clear pro-fossil fuel direction. It's the lack of any sort of real federal action on housing, for example. It's the desperate bid to sidestep a same-sex marriage course of action and then to make an oleaginous speech to Parliament on the victory as if he was Mandela emerging from prison to be president. It's the inability to take decisive action on ministers such as Michaela Cash and Barnaby Joyce. It's the willingness to take up state dog whistling on issues such as African crime in Melbourne. It's the waffling on both sides on live anim animal exports. It's, well, what's interesting is that it's everything. Turnbull appears to be that distinctive political type, the man without qualities. In an adversary on policy, on worldview, you can find qualities to admire. On the other hand, you can judge a political ally, someone whose ends you agree with, to be a worm and still find a degree of fellow feeling. When the two are combined, when you have a worm who constitutes in the Schmittian sense the, the defining enemy, one's contempt becomes total. Indeed, one's contempt almost disables analysis. And that, it seems to me, is an interesting proposition. Why is it that when one's enemy is essentially a null set as both a political agent and a public human being, why is that so disconcerting to us? Why don't we simply regard it as a piece of good luck? After all, these are in some ways not the worst of times. Labor, under various pressures, is going leftwards. There's a global wave of socialism sweeping the advanced capitalist world. Forty years of neoliberalism have left it now largely or, or seriously discredited, rather than simply the prevailing conditions under which we live. We can talk about things like the public ownership of the electricity system, or the energy system, or the banks, or the train system in the UK once again, without that feeling like it's a piece of antiquarianism. So these are things that haven't been around for a decade or more, or longer. Yet on the other hand, it feels like the worst of times. However compromised, limited, and third-rate things once were, parliamentary politics felt like an arena of struggle even for those who did not concede its legitimacy on its own terms. Now it feels like a grey no-zone, a room off a side corridor wandered into from the real action. Some people, the Keatingite cultish press gallery, will say it's the people themselves, that giants no longer stride the land 
enacting the thing beloved by Laura Tingle and her crowd, reform. <laughs> reform is Moses and the prophets. Reform without content. Others will say it's the structure and the politics today that produces a politics that does not feel like politics. What I would suggest is, and I think this is a clue, both a clue to Turnbull and Turnbull is a clue to this, is that it's both. The structural shifts globally and locally in politics have changed politics and they've changed the people turning up for it. Those people in turn are less capable of changing the way politics is done, less capable of even imagining how it could be done and we thus have something of a death spiral in mainstream core politics. To say that parliamentary politics has been sidelined across the West as transnational capital limits the capacity for national policy action is a commonplace by now. A couple of months after the death of the great James O'Connor who first and most clearly identified the fiscal crisis of the state. But it should be notable, notable how relatively straightforwardly this has begun to be challenged, often in inchoate and sometimes reactionary ways. In Italy, for example, as we speak, it's clear that a crisis is coming to a head that is not merely constitutional, but a crisis of constitutivity. What is the state? What is politics? Where is the polis? The Italian crisis, in which a president has refused to appoint an anti-Euro prime minister and tried to impose a pro-Euro prime minister on a parliament that is anti-Euro, is occurring in a confected country in which democracy has collapsed several times in a century. But now it lies at the height of an, heart of an entwined European project, once a social democratic project, and now one largely serving North European capital as a form of neoliberal enforcement. Things are coming down fast, given Italy's central role in the Euro project. Yes, of course, yet of course they're doing so out of a literally farcical politics, an alliance between the grim league, the Liga, once the Northern League, a regionalist party that has gone to great success by ceasing to be a regionalist party and becoming a generalist sort of corporatist one, in alliance with the Five Star Movement, formed by Beppe Grillo, who was a one-time student of Dario Fo. So absurdism has sort of become, satirical absurdism has come to the centre of the actual enactment of politics. The left, meanwhile, is trapped on the pro-Euro side, carrying the can for its re remnant supranationalist support of this form of internationalism. That is a full hot mess of politics, but actual politics it is. And the fact that this is going on elsewhere simply throws the deadness and absurdity of our own process into full relief. The simple way to put it is this. With the brief interruption of about two years of the first Rudd government, we have had a smooth and steady neoliberalisation of every aspect of Australian state and society. And what now appears to be in retro what now appears in ret what appeared at the time to be the calm efficiency of the Gillard government can now seem to be in retrospect the calm efficiency of a government that was calm and efficient because it was relentlessly imposing neoliberalism and cutting with the grain of of the society and that's from the NDS to fair work and everything else and we can now everybody can now see this visibly when you look at the passage of things like, when you compare, for example, the implementation of fair work to work choices, you'd have to say that the Gillard outfit were better neoliberals than Howard and Costello were. If that is measured as the smooth integration of state, economy and politics into, into a single whole, lacking a significant outside within actually existing capitalism. That period marked the apotheosis of a smooth, 20 years of a smooth implementation of such. But here's the interesting thing. The politicians manage that, managing that at the very start of it were those who had grown up and gained their political stripes in the left-right battles of the Cold War. Their standard politics was constitutive. They still saw the state as something to be uh, battled over. They still saw policy as something to be battled over. 
social policy, foreign policy, uh, and so forth. They still saw social holes as at stake. But they created a situation, they created a forum uh, in which the politicians and the press gallery journalists who came after that last generation were formed by that very process of depoliticization. Politics had been a place for those who didn't want a quiet life, who wanted a life of struggle and a place for themselves in the battle, the war. By the 2010s, it had become a place, something for those who wanted a place for themselves in Barara waters a seat on a super or bank board, and to be at the top table in Richo's Chinese restaurant, <laughs> where the lazy Susan of post-political life never stops spinning. Increasingly, as new forms of media, the internet and corporate megalomania boomed, politics became a place for the chances and mediocrities. It became a place for those who, at an early age, recognised in themselves that they were mediocrities and needed a framework in which mediocrity would be recognised. <laughs> the heroes of, the era, of our era, the Steve Jobses, the Elon Muskers, strike a defiantly post-political aura. The allure of ultra-high tech suggested that there was actually no conflict of ends and politics was just a relic of a period in which problems did not present themselves to be solved as nothing other than a conundrum. Now, there's clearly a fascist edge to this. You can see it in the styling, even, of these figures, the sort of the futurismo, the black skivvies, the private moonshots, uh, and that sort of like. But interestingly, that sort of fascismo is mirrored in the anti-tech populism of figures like Trump. So Trump's great promise to his uh, constituents and the working class, many working class people who voted for him, was not that you would get a share of the new economy that was coming, but that he would essentially recreate a 1960s, 70s economy, uh, a Keynesian industrial economy where um, people could get good, simple, well-paid jobs um, and where things were comprehensible once again. You know, the great... Uh, the great thing that Trump offered people was that it was all right to feel that they didn't understand anything anymore uh, and that they were being increasingly dominated by a bunch of nerds who understood a whole series of invisible processes and reaped billions from the money. In Australia, continued growth and textbook Keynesian avoidance of a demand crisis in the 2008 GFC have given us an entirely different process. Politics remains suspended in aspic. No movements suggest themselves or can gain purchase. One Nation, Nick Xenophon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They continually start and then fall apart under the weight of their own lightness of being. <laughs> Consequently, our mainstream politicians have become the worst in the world, just as those elsewhere are being shaken up. And Malcolm Turnbull, this is who Malcolm Turnbull is, Malcolm Turnbull is the king of these because he is the non-politician who performs as badly as a politician. <laughs> he is drawn into politics as, as a non-politician, an anti-politician, the problem solver from outside. Yet then all he has to offer is the cheap slogans and lack of solutions that characterise politics. People keep looking for the Australian Trump and of course they found him. We're being ruled by him but he's just not very good at it. <laughs> the content may differ, as does the vitality in Alain, but the general form does not. 30 news polls in, Malcolm Turnbull is an elite figure who presents as a failed populist. His extraordinary survival tells us the particular paradox in which we exist. Spared the worst of a global crash, we have the worst of the best of it. A politics which seems immutable, consumed in process, decaying into general corruption and incapable of producing someone within who could transform it. In negative fashion, Malcolm Turnbull has made a unique, a political synthesis of the unique, uncanny dissatisfaction we feel in our era, which is politics as a bad fuck. <laughs> can, you, can you repeat that? <laughs> in negative fashion, 
Turnbull has made a political synthesis of the unique, uncanny dissatisfaction we feel in our own era, which is politics is a bad fuck. <laughs> Given that there is no guarantee that Mr Disappointment can not disappoint us afresh and eke out a narrow victory in 2019 or later this year, that would mark a new first, a disappointingly disappointing disappointment. <laughs> Who better to lead us to that than Mr. 30, Mr. 35, Mr. 40, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Yeah.